you read a lot of books about Buddhism, about the Dharma, it get pretty confusing after a while, because there are lots of different takes on exactly what the Dharma is. And there are a lot of people that will tell you that it's all very complex, very subtle. And there seem to be so many teachings. It's hard to figure out which one to grab hold of. And of course, some people tell you you can't grab hold of anything. So it's good to remember that the Buddha himself, when he talked about wisdom, would tend to talk in very simple terms. And all the teachings derive from a few very basic, very commonsensical kinds of principles. You might call it wisdom for dummies. The kind of wisdom that comes from looking at what's actually going on in your life and asking some very basic questions and holding to just a couple of very basic principles. There's one point where the Buddha says the difference between a fool and a wise person is that the fool doesn't know what is his or her own set of duties and tends to go and ignore the things you're responsible for and to focus on things you're not responsible for. The wise person, if you're wise, you see what you're responsible for and you focus on that. That's probably the number one principle, because that cuts out a lot of other issues as to whether where the universe came from or if the universe came from anything. Whether it's finite, infinite, a lot of what we think of metaphysical issues, those get put by, set aside. What are you responsible for? Are you responsible for what your actions are, what you're doing, what you're choosing to do? You do have those choices. That's where Buddha, the Buddha says the beginning of wisdom comes when you ask someone who's knowledgeable what is skillful, what's unskillful. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term harm and suffering? That distinction between skillful and unskillful right there is another one of the basic principles. One of the Buddha's lay students was, one time was accosted by someone from another, another tradition and asked him, well, does your teacher teach about the origin of the universe, whether it's finite, infinite? went down the list of the big issues of the time, and the, the man said, well, no, he doesn't teach any of those things. Then they accused him, well, he doesn't teach anything at all then. And he said, no, he does teach that the difference between what's skillful and what's not. You can take that as the basic principle to hold on to. And then as those questions that start you on the path to what's wise, Explain that being skillful is acting in a way that leads to your long-term welfare and happiness. And this is wise because when you see it is an important issue, something you really are responsible for, and it's because your happiness depends on your actions, and that long-term is better than short-term. And that distinction between skillful and unskillful is, lies at the basis for the Four Noble Truths. You dig deep down into why people suffer, and it's because of craving. How can people stop suffering? Well, you develop good qualities of mind. So you realize the mind has to be trained. That's another basic principle of wisdom. That true happiness comes from developing good qualities in the mind, because it's the mind that makes the choices. That's why we meditate. That's why we try to focus our attention on the present moment, it's because these choices are being made right now. But then you also realize there's another issue that comes up, 
Part of it's this distinction between short-term and long-term happiness. Realizing that in some cases the choice is between doing something that's harmful and something that's not harmful, but other times there are things that lead to at least some happiness and some well-being, but it's short-term. You have only a limited amount of time and a limited amount of energy. So you don't want to get distracted by the short-term things. And then there's that part of the mind that sometimes likes doing the things that lead to suffering, because it's happiness in the short term that's going to lead to long-term suffering. And there are other things that are difficult in the short term but are going to give long-term happiness down the line. And so you need strategies and tactics for getting the mind to avoid the things that you like doing that are going to be harmful in the long term and to get yourself to do the things that may be difficult now but will give you long-term happiness. This is where teachings like the Brahma Viharas come in. You remind yourself that you want to be kind to yourself. You want to be kind to other people. You want to develop that kind of attitude because it helps you. When a short-term happiness would lead to long-term suffering, either for yourself or other people, it really helps to have these attitudes developed in the mind already. It's another reason why we meditate, is to develop these attitudes. And having the breath as a way of training yourself to be kind to yourself is an important aspect of that, because it helps you realize that you really do have a role in shaping your present experience, starting with the breath and then moving into other areas of your present experience. And there's nobody forcing you to breathe in an uncomfortable way or in a way that puts yourself to sleep, or in a way that gets you anxious. And we allow these things to happen, because we're usually distracted many times about things that really are not any of our business. But this is something that is your responsibility. Nobody else can breathe for you, and nobody else can tell you what kind of breathing is going to be comfortable. You have to pay attention yourself. So this is one area where you really are responsible. And it does have a huge impact. If the mind has this sense of inner well-being, you're operating from a position of strength. You don't have to be a slave to things outside. You don't have to have the mind shaken by things outside. Because you have a different source for your happiness that comes from within. And you get more and more sensitive to one of the big issues in this whole question of cause and effect, which underlies all, a lot of this, the basic principles on wisdom or discernment, which is that some causes have an effect over time, and some causes have an effect immediately, and some have both. So when you're facing any experience in the present moment, part of it comes from past actions and part of it comes from things you're doing right now. And it takes sensitivity to figure out which is which. You may be suffering from something right now, there may be pain, but you don't have to suffer from it. The choices you're making right now are the ones that are really the important ones. There may be pain in the body, there may be thoughts that come up in the mind that are un undesirable. But as you focus more carefully on the present moment, you begin to realize you do have a choice. You can let yourself suffer and fall victim to these things, or you can make a change. This point is really misunderstood when you read in the, the Buddhist teachings on mindfulness. It's possible to interpret them as saying that when you're being mindful, say, of your feelings, you just you know, watch whatever comes up and you can't make any change and you're trying not to meddle with it, but just allow these things to happen and be non-reactive. What's that, what that's doing, though, is driving underground some are really important sources for insight to see to what extent are you shaping your feelings of pleasure and pain right now. 
And here we're, here we're talking both about physical pleasure and mental pleasure, physical pain and mental pain. So when you talk about the things you do to lead to happiness, it's not just your external actions, it's also the way you think, the way you interpret, filter, make choices about how you deal with whatever comes up in the present moment, purely an internal basis. And so you learn how to breathe in a comfortable way, you learn how to think in a comfortable way. Fashion your thoughts, fashion your perceptions, so it leads to a greater sense of well-being. It doesn't have to. You don't have to invest any money. It just takes time and using your powers of observation. That's what it all comes down to. So these are very simple things. very simple principles that we're operating on. What the Buddha does, though, is he takes these very simple principles and he follows them through to see what their implications are. That it's wise to realize that you're responsible for some things and not for other things. This applies to that issue of when you're experiencing something, you have to ask yourself, is this something that comes from the past or is it something that I'm actually doing right now? And you look for the issue of how you're creating suffering for yourself, or how you can create the causes for happiness. And then as you follow this, you begin to get more and more sensitive to where you are creating unnecessary suffering. This is how that question on skillfulness begins to translate into the the three perceptions are sometimes, or are sometimes called the three characteristics, because you're looking for happiness that is long-term. As I say, my long-term welfare and happiness. And so as you notice what's being created in the present moment, which is long-term and which is short-term, you begin to realize that if it's short-term, if it changes, if it's inconstant, you can't rely on that as your true happiness. These three perceptions help to become your principles for judging what's working and what's not. If it's inconstant, if it's stressful, then you can't have, hold on to it as your long-term welfare and happiness. But the other question is, well, maybe it's a stressful cause that will eventually lead to long-term happiness. So you keep that point in mind. But if it's painful, both in terms of the cause, but especially in terms of the result, that's something you want to drop as well. Say, this is not what I'm looking for. It's like going into a place where you can pan for gold, and you want to have standards for, okay, what are you looking for as you pan for the gold there? Certain colors you're looking for, certain characteristics for the gold nuggets. And it's for the stuff that doesn't pass those characteristics, you just throw it away, throw it away, throw it away. The analogy breaks down, though, that in some things that are not the gold themselves, but they are actually part of the path for finding the gold. In other words, these qualities that we develop in terms of virtue, concentration, discernment. Those are not ultimately what we're looking for, but they do help us get there. But when you're looking at the results, you want to have some way of separating the gold from the dross or the gold from the gravel. And so the question about happiness relates to the perception of stress. If you see the stress there, you realize, okay, that's not really happiness. You let it go. The question about long term relates to the characteristic of inconstancy. If it's inconstancy, you, that's not what you're looking for. You learn how to let it go. 
you know, the things that should be let go for this reason, you don't want to claim them as yours. So those three words, my, long-term, welfare and happiness, well, those three phrases are related to the three perceptions of the three characteristics. So if you follow these basic principles through, you find that, that they explain everything in the Buddhist teachings. You focus on what's your responsibility, and you realize that your responsibility is the fact that you're creating unnecessary suffering. But you could also create long-term happiness. Then you use the Buddhist teachings as tools to help you realize it. If there's some things you want to do, but you know they're going to cause harm, you want some help in learning how to talk yourself out of it. The Buddha gives lots of analogies for, say, why anger, even though anger may feel good, it's not good for you. Or lust may feel good, but it's not good for you. And it may seem very powerful, but you've got to have strategies for learning how not to be overpowered by it. As for the things that are difficult, when it's difficult to be generous or it's difficult to be virtuous, difficult to meditate, again, you need ways of helping yourself get over the hump. Tools, strategies, ways of thinking that make it easier. So that you find that you can let go of the things that you like, but are troublesome, cause harm, and arrive at that true happiness, which ultimately lies beyond even wisdom. It's the fourth of what the Buddha said of the four noble dhammas. There's virtue, there's concentration, there's discernment, and then there's release. And all of this aims at release, because ultimately even wisdom gets put aside. But in the meantime, you want to learn how to use it and realize it is pretty basic stuff. It's just following these basic principles. and see how far they can take you as you get more and more sensitive to what the questions are and what becomes a more and more skillful answer to those questions. So that basically is wisdom for dummies. It doesn't mean that you're dumb. In fact, sometimes it's the, the dumb people who think that wisdom has to be counterintuitive, it has to be about hidden essences and mysterious teachings that don't make sense. But you've got these basic principles. One, focus on what really is your responsibility and let go of the things that you're not responsible for. And two, do what you can to develop better and better answers to that question of what leads to your long-term welfare and happiness. And then take advantage of the, the tools that the Buddha offers so that it's easier to give up the things that you like doing that are harmful and to get yourself to do the things that are difficult but will lead to long-term happiness that you want. John Lee has a nice image. It's a person going to the, the mountain and comes back with a big hunk of rock. Comes and starts to get the gold ore out of it. And the person who assumes that he's smart says, oh, who wants a big hunk of rock? Let's just, I just want the gold. And so you go and try to take a pick and dig the gold out of the mountain. But it doesn't work that way. You have to take the rock and you have to put it into the smelter and heat it. And then the gold comes out, the silver comes out, all these other minerals come out when you reach their melting, melting point. If you're willing to put in the effort. to figure out what is skillful, what is not skillful. There's another expression they have is that you're not trying to climb the tree from the top down, learning all the subtle concepts and all those advanced treatises. 
they're not going to get you to where you want to go. It's admitting that, well, I, there's a lot that I don't know and I can't figure it out just by reading, but I can figure it out by sitting here and watching what I'm doing and seeing what's working to give long-term happiness. If you're willing to be the sort of person who doesn't have things figured out all ahead of time, but you know that you've got some good tools, that's what's going to get you to where you want to go.